I want to show to share a, a really fantastic case that Antonina Kalmakova has uh, shared with me. It's uh, it's just it's such a perfect perfect uh, slide, and um, let's just see what we can see at the lowest power. Now, this is the sort of biopsy specimen that I used to get when we started when I started training in pathology. Um, it was before the era of the punch biopsy and the shave biopsy, and so when a patient presented with a a largest tumor like this one, then you got to see all of it, which of course may, makes diagnosis much, much easier. And in some ways, uh, it makes more sense. Let, let's face it, if you do a punch biopsy of that, you may well end up with a non-diagnostic field and you'll do all sorts of immunohistochemistry and you still won't know what it is. Um, but if you'd got the whole thing out in one go, it might have been plain and simple. Now, I don't have any history, but we can see that the uh, epidermis is rather thin. There's not much in the way of dermis, and there's uh, a lot of subcutaneous fat. So the thinner dermis makes the back unlikely. The absence of hair follicles makes the head and the face and the axilla most unlikely. I would guess this, is, this may have come from the, the abdomen, or perhaps it's come from a limb, so let's say the, the, the forearm, but I don't know to be truthful. But anyway, let's have a look at it. And wow, now is this... Is this not gorgeous? If it isn't gorgeous, then it's time to pack it in, I think. You really don't get anything nicer than this. Um, so there is um, there's the non-lesional epidermis, and here you can see that there's a basaloid tumor. That's, it looks as if it's vaguely... Let's have a check that out. It looks as if it might... Yes, I think it is. I think it's showing multifocal origin from uh, the epidermis, which of course is very obviously ulcerated. So let's go back to times two again. So we've got a basaloid tumor arising from the epidermis. So what things do we think of right, right away? Well, the commonest basaloid tumor is going to be a basal cell carcinoma. Then we could think of a trichoblastoma, that would be basaloid. Uh, basaloid squam, I suppose, is possible. Um, sebaceous carcinoma is, is possible. So let's have a look and see if uh, higher power can help us resolve that dilemma. Well, there you can see that there is vacuolation of these basaloid cells. There's also necrosis in the middle. So I think we know we're in the territory of a carcinoma. And what we don't see on this low power is we don't see really distinctive peripheral palisading. And we don't see any retraction artifact or with or without mucin. So I think basal cell carcinoma is going down, down and out of our differential. The other thing we don't see, um, just of importance, is there's no there's no follicular specific stroma. This is just compressed dermis. It's not follicular stroma. So um, trichoblastoma is going out the window very quickly too. And in fact. Um, the two differentials that I would think of at this magnification are either a sebaceous carcinoma, I suppose it might be a porocarcinoma, and I suppose it could be a high-grade basaloid squamous carcinoma showing clear cell change. So those, those would be my, my three differential diagnoses. Let's see if looking at high power helps. Now, 
Well, ah, oh, well, look, look, there we are. We're absolutely in business. There is the most beautiful field there, and the diagnosis is now obvious. There is one of these cells. It's got multiple small round vacuoles, sort of indenting the nucleus in the middle. That is the nicest SIBO site you could ever want to see in a sebaceous carcinoma. And in fact, there's another one there. And the, the vacuoles are very variable in size and shape. They're little tiny ones around there and some there. Um, sometimes, obviously, these vacuoles have coalesced to give rise to a signet ring cell appearance, which obviously in a different context would, would make you think of, um, of uh, uh, ductal intracytoplasmic lumina and that sort of thing. But we've got, um, we've got clear, clear sebaceous differentiation that I just showed you. So I, I don't think the diagnosis is really a problem. And there, there's a nice mitosis there. And uh, let's just look at look at other fields um, to get a an overall sense of what's going on. There's a nice field there where there's nice uh, vacuolation. See if we can pick up more SIBO sites. And uh, oh, indeed, we have there. There are more SIBO sites there. And um, there are lots of mitotic figures, the tumor is teeming with them. So I don't think we really have a problem making a diagnosis in this case. This is clearly um, sebaceous carcinoma. Uh, I don't have a differential diagnosis, it's, uh, that's what it is. Now, what's important about sebaceous carcinoma? Well, there are several things. First of all, it's a high-grade tumor. And no matter what treatment you give the patient, there's at least a 25% risk of metastasis, and probably the death rate's not much different. So uh, it's not a good tumor to have. Now, um, the books distinguish periocular sebaceous carcinoma from extraocular sebaceous carcinoma and um, there's not a lot, lot of logic to it really in that they both behave the same but I suppose it's fair to say that extraocular are more likely to be associated with Tori Muir syndrome or Muir Tori syndrome as people like to say nowadays and the other thing that's interesting, at least wise it's my experience anyway, is that the periocular ones often show pagetoid uh, epidermal involvement and the extraocular ones tend not to. I'm not sure that's a sort of a definite hard and fast rule, but it, it's something that, that I've noticed and I think the books mention. And then the other thing we have to remember is that um, particularly with extraocular sebaceous carcinoma, we need to think about the possibility of microsatellite instability and, and uh, Muratori syndrome and Lynch syndrome. And to do this, we look for um, a, a, a variety of immunohistochemical reactions and I'm going to look down here for just to see what we've got in our list. So we're going to to look at um, oh is, isn't that lovely now look this is um, this is MLH1 and I'm going to turn it round. So this is the mismatch repair gene. Um, I'm just checking this. Uh, yes, this is MLH1. So we'll get that in the center. And um, well, 
Now, the, the funny thing is there's, the, there's a very strange artifact going on which one has to ignore these dark um, bits where I think the tissues crinkled or folded. But having said that, it's pretty obvious that the uh, nuclei are all, are virtually all staining up. So there's no loss of, uh, there is no loss of MLH1. So we can forget about that. Now, what's the next one we've got? Um, this is PMS2. There we are there. I'm just checking with my my uh, screenshot of what these are. Yes, this is this is uh, PMS two. I'm gonna straighten that one up, and it looks to me as if that one's going to be strikingly positive too. So let's. Oh, that's looking looking pretty good. Let's put this at higher magnification. Yes, so uh, that is normal. So there's no loss of that um, gene expression. Then, then we'll look. The next one is MSH two. Right, um, this one is beginning to look as if we're getting somewhere. So this is MSH2, and gosh, I shouldn't have gone to, oh, there, there's the um, positive control in the epidermis, so that's quite useful. I'll go down a par because I'm obviously, miles from the tumor. Oh, wow. Well, you can't ask for a more negative than that. That's just wondrously negative. So there's complete loss of um, MSH2. And then we have another one to look at. Let me just see. MSH6. And there's MSH6 there. And I'll turn that one round. And we'll see what we've got here. And there's our nice internal control. This is all artifact, all the, these um, round blobs. You see there, so one has to make sure one doesn't look at those, otherwise one will get completely confused. And there's, um, well, there's certainly diminished expression. It's not completely lost because there are there are positive nuclei, but most of the tumor is negative. So I think we could say there's some some loss. Uh, there's a bit more expression there, so it is reduced. That would probably be the best way to, to think of that one. And then lastly, we've got, um, we've got uh, adipophilin, which, um, which one's that? Uh, just bear with me. One, two, three. This is adipophilin here. And uh, we'll have a look at that. And it's variable, isn't it? So there are areas that are intensely stained and areas that are, are not so intensely stained. Let's uh, look at it at higher power. I think it's really only staining the cells that are producing decent sebocytes. The, the uh, basaloid population is not so strongly uh, positive. 
I looked at this earlier, I'm just looking around to see if we can get some nice areas to look at at high power. There I think we can see decent, decent, decent expression. So this has been quite helpful, but it's interesting and useful to know that the, the pure basaloid cells are negative. So I suppose if you looked at a, a biopsy of only a, a basaloid bit of this tumor, that could easily have been negative, which would have you in trouble. Now, other immunohistochemistry that people like is our EMA is quite useful. Uh, androgen receptors quite useful. Um, and those are the three that I have experience of. I mean, there's all sorts of other ones, but as I haven't used them, I shan't talk about them. There's a nice field there. Now, the point is, um, the point is, you, this is the immunohistochemistry, I suppose, that you do need to do. You need to see whether the patient has muratory syndrome or not. And this applies to all true sebaceous tumors. So it doesn't apply to sebaceous hyperplasia, which is very common and is of no importance other than you might mistake it for something else, which you shouldn't do, but sometimes that happens. But sebaceous adenoma, sebaceoma, sebaceous carcinoma, those all may herald an underlying Tori Muir syndrome of which sebaceous adenoma is the most common, and that's because it's the most common tumor. Sebaceous carcinoma is a pretty rare tumor. One, one sees it from time to time, but uh, I'm trying to think, one sees more periocular ones, and they constitute about 75% of cases, so that's not surprising. I, uh, and the rest of the spacious carcinomas, mostly they're on the face and the head. You can get them elsewhere, and in fact you can get um, all sorts of viscera may have spacious carcinoma, all the way through to uh, a teratoma of the ovary can have a spacious carcinoma in it. Mind you, I've not seen one, but it's certainly documented. Anyway, so I do hope this you're as enthusiastic about this case as I am. I think it's absolutely wonderful. It's a perfect example of a fairly rare tumour. And, um, well, thank you very much for your attention.